So Happy New Year, everyone. It feels a little odd to be saying that because the year does not officially start uh, in uh, the rest until January 1st. But in the church's tradition, we have always begun the new year with the Advent season, the getting ready for the celebration of the birthday of the Lord. And it's a time when, you haven't ever seen me with paper in my hand before, but I just wanted to make sure I got all these points in so that you all understand. And then if anybody wants a copy, they can take it home with them. Joan. So, uh, but there's something very interesting about this time because there's a lot of different perspectives of what Advent means. For example, it's a time of pretending to wait and pretending that Jesus hasn't been born and that we're pretending to get ready and then we're getting ready for his birthday and then we go, yay, Jesus is in the crib, we're all having a happy Christmas. And is that really the way that we want to spend our, our, our Advent season? Hello? Because of the penitential nature that the church invites us into, it's kind of seen as a little bit of a Lenten experience, a little shorter, a time to get ready, to be wake and woke. That's why we have a change in all of the atmosphere, the purple and the, the, and the blues, getting ready for the, the, the Advent journey so it can be penitential. It's also from the readings today, eschatological, big word, huh? It really means the end times. And all throughout history, there's always been predictions of this, especially when it came to the year 2000 and all of those cults. And if anybody's running around telling you it's all over, take a second look at them and keep walking. Because it's an invitation, really, I think, in the early church, there was always Jesus. And these readings is, is trying to prepare his disciples for what is about to come. He is preparing them to how it is going to be without him, but him in a different form. You know, the other day we had Thanksgiving here in the, in the, the church hall. We, we had tables for five, uh, 50 people, but we had about 65 people. I counted six teenagers in the room. If the end is coming, all of the teenagers will be like this. They won't even notice the signs of the times because they're going to be so caught up in their phones that they're going to miss the whole thing. And even when you try to cajole them or be playful. And I think there's a certain uh, part in us all that gets caught up in technology and in all of the stuff of life and not really watching and being present uh, to our the feeling of the gift of self. And so the end times, you know, you always get ready, you always live in this tension. Like for example, how many of you honestly hand on your heart? How many of you have earthquake kits? Where's your earthquake kit? You do need one. one. Everybody needs to live with that reality. If you were here in 1989 and you felt the ground shake, I can assure you, you need your earthquake kit. You know the big one is coming. And you must always live. I have barrels of water and a big closet out there all filled with stuff. I'm not so sure I'm going to share it with all of you guys that are not prepared. <laughs> so you got to be prepared for yourself. Live. You know, I'll be honest with you, when I'm sitting under that freeway over here, uh, going, heading to San Francisco and all of that stuff, I'm always somehow conscious. I'll wait back here in the car I'm, in case, you know, if the big one comes, it's going to come straight down. So I'll just wait and let, and if somebody wants to come around me and go in there, they're welcome to that little crushing potential moment. But we can't live like that. We must live with this creative tension that we all know and it doesn't go it's not a miss on me and this year we have lost 14 priests in our diocese maybe 15 eight of them died they all heard these readings last year these readings are meant to be for us that life is precious 
It was beautiful. But you are not promised the next moment. And that's not to scare anybody. It's to be awake and alive to what that, the parousia, the moment of coming. And the early church felt this. For a while, the church was on its tippy toes, waiting, Paul and all of the rest of them, waiting for Jesus coming next minute, next hour. But you can only stand on your tippy toes for a little while. After a while, you have to get down to basics, and the church set itself into the rhythm of life of how this eschatological moment, this moment of the future, and get, it, get itself into a rhythm that allows us. That's why you cannot go back all the way to the early church and say, well, that's how we're supposed to be church. We have to be church in the place that we're loved in, in the present moment. Amen? Amen. It also can be a time to get caught up with the really busyness. Advent is a busy time. The moment I walked into Costco two months ago and walked in and saw all that Christmas decorations, I went, no, I'm not ready for Christmas. We have, we're two months away from Advent, and yet for the uh, commercialism and selling of stuff, Christmas is almost over. The inventory is there. The reductions and the sales are happening. So I would like to suggest to you that it's a little bit of all of the above. All of these things are operating at the same time. But what I would like to suggest to you is, God is already with us. Emmanuel, God is with us. We're not suspending reality. We are invited to be awake to the gift of ourselves, the gift of life, and we're given this new opportunity to be able to say, God already accepts us. Accept the fact that you're accepted. Accept the fact that God already loves you and love the fact that you are already loved. Celebrate the fact that God is celebrating you and that each and every one of us are called into the dream of God's love for each and every one of us. So we're invited to be awake, to be alive to the presence of God, just like St. Paul was with that level of enthusiasm. You can't maintain it always, but certainly you can celebrate the gift of life. And this is an opportunity the church provides us to do that, to be woke and awake. Now, I'm gonna do something really boring, but that's your problem to be bored for a few minutes. I'm gonna do a teacher type moment. I'm gonna do a sister, Marian Castelluccio type of a thing. I'm gonna do a little teaching. It's, well, it's not that boring, it's okay. <laughs> I would like to invite us to look into the mind of the new person that we are going to be listening to for the next year. In our church, we're given the opportunity to listen to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Last year, we had Luke, and who has a very distinctive community that he was writing in. Matthew is no different. Matthew's community, he is writing from a long time away from the Jesus experience. This Matthew is writing in modern-day Syria, in Antioch. He may have been writing in the Syrian language, the Aramaic. He may have been writing in with the Greek influence. He's writing to a community that's totally different from Luke's, totally different from John's. So the experience of the lived reality is calling us. And I don't say a lot of these things to upset anyone because each and every one of us are given God-given intellect. We know there's a historical context. We are not, as Catholics, fundamentalists. We're invited to use our brains and we are invited to look at the historical, socioeconomic, uh, and all the different religious factors that come together that celebrated in that community. So who was Matthew? Well, Matthew's not the dude that was hanging out with Jesus. And he's not the guy that came crawling out of the tree and Jesus went to his house. It is physically impossible for that to be because Jesus was what age when he died? 30, okay, the nun is the only person at the church who knows that Jesus was 33 when he died. How old was Jesus when he died? How old was he when he rose? That's not a trick question. It happened three days later. 
So Jesus says, this Matthew, this writing of this particular script, of inspired by God, is given to us in the year 85, give or take a few years. So that would have meant the Matthew that was hanging out with Jesus would have been 100 years old or so. And in that, that's double what the life expectancy was from that time. Though we can say quite clearly that is not this Matthew, but that does not detract from the community. The other thing that uh, Matthew did in writing uh, is after the time of the fall of the temple. Uh, so the year 70 that Jesus predicted the temple would fall, and when the temple fell, up until that point there were many versions of Judaism. Uh, they wouldn't have necessarily called themselves Jews. There were people of the covenant. There were the Essenes, the Sadducees, the Zealots, the priests, the Pharisees. All of these different groups were there present, but they all focused their attention on the temple, on the, the presence of God in the, in the covenant, in that holy place. But when that was destroyed, all of those groups dispersed all over uh, that region of the world. And the two communities that were left were the Nazareans, who later became the Christians, and the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees began to say, well, we need to reevaluate all of this. We don't want all of those people that were all in the different groups before. What we want is one united Jewish community. United, we, we rise, divided, we fall. So we have to get rid of all of the groups. So they essentially excommunicated the community that was those who followed Jesus. And Matthew in this, in his text, is a great odds to tell us we are just as Jewish, we are just as much part of Moses, we're just as part of Abraham. Jesus went down, uh, down into the Egypt. The children were lost because of him. Like Moses, spent 40 uh, days, 40 years in the desert. Like Jesus, like Moses, he went up onto the mountaintop, the Ten Commandments, the Beatitudes. He goes to great pains to show, to show that Jesus Christ is the authentic, authentic inheritor of this mission of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Matthew also was the... Uh, so you end up seeing these really nasty interactions between the Pharisees and the Christian people. You see that all through the story. So it's really important for us to see that context because too many people in history, in a very evil way, have used these texts to kill millions of Jews in the Holocaust. So it's really important for us to be able to look into the Bible and look into the heart and soul of what is being said to us in the here and the now. Amen? Matthew also saw his community as a very authentic strain of the covenant. And so he shows in the scriptures over and over again that we are the authentic inheritors of Judaism and of the promise of God. He also was one who was uh, scored many other points because he also is very universal in his call just as Abraham was. Abraham is the father of Judaism and the Muslim tradition and the Christian tradition. We have that same reality because Matthew talks to us about the universalism of all people. The Magi come from the East to Christ's birth. The Roman centurion, the Canaanite woman. Through Abraham, all peoples are blessed, uh, bless us, and so does Jesus. Matthew's the only one that ever mentions the word church. Uh, he's into discipleship. He's into building up the church. He sees Peter as the rock on which the church is built. And so we have a great emphasis in our church tradition of seeing this Catholic with small c, the, the, the evangelist that most celebrates that gift. In the other gospels, it seems that the only people that get called all the time are the men. Ladies, 
You should really celebrate Matthew because he does a lot in calling women. Think of the genealogy that tries to tie Jesus into that tradition. And his genealogy, women like Tamar, uh, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba. Then there's Mary, and then Simon Peter's mother-in-law, and the woman who anoints Jesus' feet, Pilate's wife, and the woman who witnesses Jesus' res crucifixion, burial. And then there's the two Marys who see and touch and are present to the risen Lord. Matthew is a teacher, and he is teaching us the reality and the gift of what God has done for us in his tradition, in his community. So it's his community's lived reality that we are going to hear in the next year. 80% of Matthew comes from Mark, 80%. And then we have the book is divided up into five different sermons, if you will, of which we get a piece of that today, those sermons. And we also get a lot of parables. So four things coming up in the next year that are going to happen. For, and I would invite you to look this up and inform yourself to be awake and woke to the reality of just not showing up on Sunday, but just to inform yourself of what's going on and not just sort of blindly being led uh, just to the reading that happens. Look it up, read it. I would go to uh, some, several of the, the Catholic Bible sites, also to Wikipedia is a great one to go to because it tends to be a little bit more objective. Google will give you all sorts of stuff. So just be careful about that. But four things. You are going to hear lots of references to the Old Testament that justifies the experience of Jesus. Hebrew Testament, you want to say to our Jewish friends, uh, when you say Old Testament, they get offended. So know who you're talking to when you're having these conversations. The other thing, he tries to validate Jesus as the true disciple of the covenant of love and that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law that they have celebrated in the Torah. Number three, there's lots of conflict with the Pharisees reflecting the tension of his own community. And so we must look at those tensions in our lives and how they resolved it and then being woke people invited out into the world to make a difference. And there are lots and lots of parables to drive home to us the message of Jesus Christ. So stay tuned. Listen with both ears. Hear the word of God proclaimed along with John at different moments of the reality that we are going to walk in the year of grace 2020. So a little story that reminds us, circling back to the gospel today, we have Isaiah telling us about the dream we have Paul who is absolutely convicted that Jesus Christ is the source of all life. And Jesus Christ is the source, the logos of the cosmos, and that everything is changed with the death and resurrection of Jesus. So God is out going for a walk one day in the middle of the countryside. And he has this young man walking with him who's rather inquisitive because he's having uh, a lot of questions, as we all do, of God if we were walking along with him. And he wants to know the direction of humanity. And he says to God, you know, why do you let bad things happen to good people? God says, hold that thought. I'm a little thirsty. I would really love a, cu a cup of nice, cool water. So why don't you go off to that little village I see there? and get me that glass of water. So he goes off. He raps on the first door that he comes along to. And who opens the door? Only the most beautiful woman in the village. And he is a little awestruck by her beauty. And he said, I would like a drop of water. And she says, oh, good sir, please come inside and I can feed you. You look a little famished. Well, he looks over his shoulder at God off in the distance, and he thought, well, I'll take a few minutes. And he goes in and sits at the table. 30 years later, he's out in his boat on the sea, and a big storm comes. And the waves are going crazy, and he thinks this is the end. 
and amongst his friends he shouts out, God, help me! And God says, where's my glass of cold water? <laughs> the invitation is, in the readings on that little parable, is to invite us to be awake, to be woke to the reality. You could call Lord, Lord at the end of time or the end of life, but if you have not done the will of God, put it into action. If you have not been the change you want to see, be it for people with AIDS or the criminal justice system or whatever it is that we need to work on in any given moment, we need to be that change. We need to be the people of God whose hearts are changed, whose souls are changed, and to be the hands and the feet of God to put it into action. May we be woke enough listening to these great people from 1,700 years ago or 2,000 years ago or whatever the time span is that we are awake enough to see the presence of God and make it a reality for ourselves. Stay tuned for Matthew. Amen. Amen. So I know that was a little teacher-esque stuff and, and, and a little on the boring side, but it gives us a little context, and that's a good thing. Let us stand and continue our prayers. No, we're not doing the creed. I didn't say that prayer. Uh, our prayers of the faithful. Your response will be, God of hope, hear our prayer. 